Hello and welcome to the fifth lecture from the final module of this course on community rights and forest governance. One of the key problems that we had recognized at the beginning of this course was that it was not enough to have a deep understanding of how the forest department works or of the law on wildlife protection or of the law on diverting forest land or of the land on forest rights. To protect and advance the interests of forest dwelling communities, it is more important to have a broader understanding of all these different laws and administrative procedures than to have a deep understanding of any one of them. Now, whether it is a situation where forest land is to be diverted for a non-forest purpose, or a situation where an inviolate space is to be established on some forest land for wildlife conservation, you already have the knowledge you need to effectively protect and advance the interests of communities. In this lecture, you will learn about some of the skills and attitudes that you need to use that knowledge. Knowing the rules and procedures that we have learned so far in this course will help you recognize situations where you need to act. But to be able to do that, in addition to an understanding of how the relevant administrative procedure works, you also need to be aware of all the developments in those administrative procedures. You need to track the legal process and be aware of what is happening at each stage of the process. Number one uh, is really knowledge and, and, and understanding of where the records are. So knowledge could be dis, uh, you know, divided into understanding uh, uh, what is the problem that you're really trying to address, uh, where you can get the records from, collection of those records, finding out if anybody has actually done any of this in the past and uh, you know, bringing those records on board because there is always doesn't you don't, may not really need to start everything afresh so really collection of that those records when it comes to knowledge is very critical struggle is very important and we have to fight it democratically using constitutionally recognized rights with the government elected by us and the companies profiting through this government we have to be fully aware of our rights and also the issue with which we are struggling what are the legal tools laws or policies that can help us this knowledge is very important. I am again taking the example of Hans Deo. Often, we start the struggle only after the processes have been completed. When we oppose a project at that stage, the struggle becomes very difficult. But if we study the processes, for example, in the Parsa coal block or in Paturia Gidmudi, where communities from Hans Deo are protesting, you will see that communities were voicing their concerns at every level, both verbally and with the help of documents. They were not merely saying that they did not want mine. Rallies and dharnas alone are not sufficient. While they are also important, they also question the processes of land acquisition in an organized manner, legally as recognized under laws like the PESA and the FRA. When the process for environmental clearance begins, they start raising concerns in writing before the public hearing and it continues till the propo proposal is presented to the EAC. They present reasons as to why the project should not get environmental clearance. Many other examples are there like Parsa East Kete Basan, where people raised concerns over the ill effects of mining on environment and issues of non-compliance around it. EAC took notice and restricted its expansion for two years and on the same ground, restricted the Parsa coal block also for two years. So I feel this is important. Similarly for the process of forest clearance, we do not simply follow the process and when diversion process is complete, say that we will not allow forest felling. Application for rights must happen well before forest clearance is necessary. What is the proposal with nodal officer? What report has been presented by the DFO? What were the recommendations by state government? Has the process of rights recognition been completed? Whether people are able to present their views and concerns to the FAC, etc., etc. This is a continuous process and it is important to nudge every single process. Whether it is for forest clearance or environmental clearance or land acquisition or even the grant of a mining lease, our comrades in Huntsdale have been doing this very efficiently for a long time and hence have been able to save it till now. There are places where, uh, you know, knowledge of law or administrative processes or projects do reach uh, through newspapers, etc., at least for few people who start reading it. But in most places, actually, uh, this information 
is not proactively provided or it, there are the, the mechanisms by which they are publicized are extremely limited uh, you know and in far flung areas definitely or that there could be a third reason where it is reported but you cannot really rely on that reportage because it the numbers are uh, problematic or anything like that so i think any person who i think in today's times has to be pretty much aware that if there is uh, there is um, you know you, you need to actually preempt the fact there could be a, a road expansion in your area there could be a, you know the uh, the forest department could be thinking of an idea of securing this place for conservation uh, if there is a proposed mining activity uh, that is likely to come up or for that matter they think there's too much poaching taking place so we want to secure it so i think communities along with any uh, research and uh, local organization support need to start preparing themselves for any intervention in that area from the conservation point of view from the production forestry point of view or from the for the diversion and acquisition point of view and each of these each of this i think information uh, fortunately or unfortunately is actually spread out in completely different government offices uh, you would get some of this information at the district collector's office some of this information at uh, the district uh, the deputy conservation uh, the the, uh, the forest department office you would get some of this information uh, at the tribal affairs ministry office uh, you would get some of this information at the industries office because that's where people have to really register what you're going to do so i think really starting to collect this information in advance trying to figure out what uh, what are the compliances of any of the processes that have happened in the past and anything that is coming up in the future public works department if they constructing a road is it for it's is it an alternative route for all the coal trucks to actually pass from a washery or is it actually for passenger uh you know finding out what railway lines are going to be coming up in the area so i think uh whether we like it or not the citizens uh, involvement in some of these processes uh rural or urban areas would need to be far more uh, proactive because even if we even if laws actually provide you um, opportunities to uh, uh be uh, opportunity around transparency and accountability there's a lot of dis distance between what happens in the books and what we see on the ground now we take for instance a scenario say on the coast where uh, often people would say think uh, the construction of a port might not require any forest land i mean why should they be you know forests are conceived perceived they appear very different in people's imagination so how can a coastal area actually have uh, forest land but there have been examples very clearly that where uh, you know say a gram panchayat has got some idea of a say a port project coming up in the area now traditionally that area uh, a mangrove area you know on a coastal area is in this part of western part of india is has been used for grazing uh, and grazing is seen as mostly an activity on revenue land but in in some cases that land has been recorded that mangrove forest where a particular kind of camel breed is is kind of uh, you know grazing is recorded as forest land now in instances like this even the moment uh, the uh, you know this this particular panchayat got to know that there is likely to be an expansion of a port coming up you first then try and ascertain whether after 2006 what has been the process of recognition of rights on that mango forest because the the law says forest land it doesn't necessarily have to say it's standing forest sitting forest empty forest degraded forest it's forest land so they actually what they did was they found out that the process was never initiated from the government's point side of so the the panchayat office it was proactive sarpanch he decided to actually get together the neighboring villages all of who had some sort of dependence of on, on that forest land they got together and they actually filed a community forest rights claim uh and so and then they continued to follow up to figure out can you come for the inspection uh we figure out the claims we have a claim on this they kept requesting the district authorities the, the district level committee to come there was one inspection and it required them to continuously follow up uh to say that rights were uh, pending here and they have been recognized or not recognized and what has been the bureaucratic process in the files of the government so they they continue to do that simultaneously they had to follow up to figure out 
what is the process of forest diversion taking place so the files for forest diversion were already moving on the on the left hand side on the right hand side the files for an environmental approval were moving uh, you know for the expansion of that project so actually having to track whatever they could online uh, all other things through uh, extended support for uh, say research groups or uh, other ngos working in the area or really knowing which department uh, is is uh, you know following up on which law so for instance if you needed information on site inspections related to the forest conservation act file an rti or do a visit to the forest forest department office at uh, near, near your space if you wanted to know uh, what is the status of the uh, what is the status of the rights process the claims that you had already put in you actually can do an action taken report rti with uh, the district collector's office so similarly if you want to know whether the wildlife division of the forest department has re recorded anything um you know uh, in their in their records about this then you need to go to the the wildlife wing of the forest department and say is there presence of any wildlife in this area that you've recorded so i think the the currently this process is underway uh, and the final forest diversion is, has not been approved so the, so sarpanch and other uh, affected villages a small group is actually constantly following up on the paper trail and figuring out where their options lie in this because many of these processes do not have a mandatory public interface to keep yourself up to date about the administrative developments regarding the use of forests in your area you need to know the relevant government offices that have been given specific functions under the various laws and legal processes that we have learned for example the rules made under the forest conservation act for diverting forests for non forest purposes lay out specific functions that the district collector's office the wildlife department of the state government and the regional office of the union ministry of environment and forests must all perform so to keep yourself informed about the administrative developments around any decision on diversion you need to track what is happening in these offices and proactively seek information this will require some interaction with the bureaucracy there is a lot of rich experience that people have dealing with administration and governments so nothing that i'm going to say is going to be you know prescriptive it's not a recipe that you'll get the right outcome uh, from this however there are few things that often are uh, useful uh, to keep in mind when we are discuss when you are interacting with governments uh, first to really know uh, whether you know prepare ourselves that the government office we are going to is the government office that can give you what you want so you know actually going to the tribal affairs office to give you something that the forest department is supposed to give you uh, can give you legally is very critical because often we for all problems we might reach a particular office when the remedy or the response might lie somewhere else so that is the first thing for any anybody to understand when you're interacting with the government because that that shapes the kind of uh, discussions you have because at the end of the discussion you might be told oh well i'm just going to forward this application somewhere else because it's not my authority you wouldn't want that to happen to you timelines are very important in the case of the right to information act the content of the application is also very important i have seen several times that people seek too much information in a single application and most often these would concern different public information offices in such a situation if one pio is aware other officers are also involved with an application he or she may just forward it specific information should be sought through an rpi application and it should be directed to a specific pio it also helps the pio in providing the information about timelines very often people submit an application and forget about it then they complain that information has not been received 30 days is the stipulated time period within which the government should respond to an rti application if the response has not been received in 30 days then submit an appeal between the 30th and 45th day if the first appeal is not heard then submit a second appeal within the stipulated time if we do not appeal against non compliance with our rti application the process stops there itself i have met many people who have submitted rti application but did not follow the appeal processes to get desired information so one needs to be careful about two things specific content of the application and timelines if you know what is the information that you want 
and who can give you the information the desired department and the desired pio then things become very easy if the application is submitted anywhere then it is up to the authorities to forward it under section 63 or not though 5 days is the stipulated time for this purpose it is very difficult so it is very important that the application is submitted properly and if response is not received within 30 days then the process should be taken up till the very end if required it should be pushed all the way to the state information commission just 10 days back i got a decision from information commission i had raised an objection under the forest rights act for the hunsdale arant coalfield area that community forest resource rights have not been recognized in our 12 villages the forest department's response as submitted to secretary was that there is no such pendency under rti i requested a copy of forest department's report i was not provided that within the 30 days period after 30 days i got a letter asking me to make the payment and take the information as it superseded the 30 days period i asked them to give the information free of cost they did not provide that and i submitted the first appeal first appeal was not heard and i submitted the second appeal finally the matter reached the state information commission and after 2 years i received the commission's decision it is indeed a time taking process the commission's decision has four components the first is that because the information was not provided in time the applicant will now be provided the required information free of cost the second was that because the appellate authority the dfo in this case did not respond on time it caused mental stress to the applicant and hence as a compensation rupees 500 had to be paid to the applicant the third was that it directed the appellate authorities to provide information on cases within the time limit the fourth was a direction to take appropriate action against the pio so it took time but i got a response and that too free of cost and actions were taken against the authorities so one has to be really patient if you draft a clear and specific application follow the timelines and stay patient the information can be collected another important aspect of being able to advance the interests of forest dwelling people is to have a support network this could be something as simple as a group of people who come together regularly to read about and understand the legal and administrative procedures involved in determining how land is used while such a support group is essential at a very local level you may also need specialized help that may not always be available in your locality the third is actually really figuring out can you develop as at least a small network support network around you sometimes issues don't necessarily uh, get resolved at the local level is there a you know a, a block level or a district level group or or a lawyer to understand uh, the law or, or just a legal activist who really use the law to really understand uh, all these processes gradually building up that network having that network not just for your immediate uh you know uh, intervention on what you need to do but as a long term strategy because once um, an infrastructure project or a, or a protected area comes up uh, in any place there could be constant kind of negotiations and discussions that you might need to do with the government uh, accordingly uh so in this process actually that network would help you even develop skills on how to talk to the government about this and sometimes protecting and advancing the interests of forest dwelling communities will even require a people's movement this means that you will have to expand your support network a large part of being able to garner support for a cause from a large number of people is to learn to communicate with a large number of people under the forest rights act tribal occupants who had been residing in these villages before 13th december 2005 and non tribals and other traditional forest dwellers who had been residing in these villages for three generations that is from 1930 onwards can claim forest rights our gram panchayat started the process by constituting forest rights committees in which scheduled tribes scheduled castes and other backward castes were members we also had women members the gram sabha decided to collect claims from all households residing there before 2005 The forest department had only one patwari 
to cater to 15 to 20 panchayats for making nazari naksha, that is visual maps. He did not have enough time. So we, at our own expense, got the nazari naksha made and submitted it to the Gram Sabhas. The respective Gram Sabhas then decided who were eligible, who are non-eligible and who will go for verification, etc. Almost all the members of the Gram Sabha went for verification of each piece of land claimed. Once the process at the Gram Sabha level were completed, once the processes at the Gram Sabha level were completed, the whole file was submitted to Gram Panchayat. After completion of the processes at the Panchayat level, the files were submitted to block level committees and district level committees. Finally, in 2008-2009, we received our forest rights titles. In my panchayat, titles were given in three stages. With these efforts of the Gram Sabhas, 80% of the households in my panchayat received their individual forest right titles, but this was not an easy task. Because our villages are forest villages, because our villages are forest villages, and the forest department was not cooperative enough, we had to start a people's movement. We did dharnas, we submitted applications to the collector, SDM and DFO. Today, the community forest rights for our villages located in the core area of the reserve has not yet been granted. Our applications are pending at the block level committee. It's been five to six years, but there has been no response from the administration. One big achievement that we see because of this organization is that people are now aware and therefore a committee was also formed which is known as Hazio Arun Bachavo Sanghash Samiti. We went from village to village and told them that when all the coal blocks, we went from village to village and told them that when all the coal blocks of this area will be opened up for mining, all of us will be displaced. It motivated people to fight this struggle to save their lives and for us. Communities from all 40 villages in this area were there when the Samadhi was formed during a meeting in which they also decided that they will not allow any more mining in this area. Dada Hirasing Makam of Gondwana Ganatandra Party suggested to name the committee Hazio Aran Bachao Sankesh Samadhi which the communities endorsed. The committee meets every month in which cadre from every village participates even though not all of them are able to come every month whenever a conference or a large group meeting whenever a conference or a large group meeting is organized 20 to 25 people from every village join in when some key decisions are to be taken some key members of the cadre sit in one village and do the needful this is an achievement when we learned that mine allotment was about to happen the hasdeo arun bachao sankesh samadhi convened a meeting and unanimously decided that every gram sabha will pass a resolution against mining in the upcoming Gram Sabha. 16 Gram Sabhas in the Hasdio area passed resolutions against mining and the representatives went to Delhi to meet authorities of different ministries, parliamentarians and ministers to tell them that communities do not want them want these mines and that we are protesting against this decision of allotment of coal blocks in this area. Whereas authorities are pressurizing communities, communities became agitated and started protesting for their rights at the SDM's office, the TSL office, the collectorate, etc. Today, in Hazio Anand, sorry, today, in Hazio Anand, this approach has started deterring authorities from putting any kind of pressure on us. The movement that we began has created this kind of environment that authorities now prefer to stay away from malpractices. So far, we have seen the importance of broadly understanding the law and the administrative procedures, the need to stay informed about the progress of administrative processes, and the importance of having support networks and organizing the people who may be affected by a decision to use the forest in a certain way. The work of building a community is different from the work of negotiating with government. While organizing a community, you may have to build common narratives for people to unite on. But while making demands from government officials, it is important to be clear and specific. You have to use your knowledge of the law to understand the specific function of a government official in a particular law or administrative procedure. Your demand from that official has to be framed in terms of the law and that function alone. 
Uh, and I think uh, that leads me also to the fourth point, which is basically a complete clarity on your demand is very critical in each of these cases. While we're laying out the problem, we might be able to understand from the knowledge of the law or what your options are to say whether something should be done this way or that way, whether there's already a violation that's taken place. But ultimately, I think what government authorities, whether in person or three, through a letter, would would uh, I would also welcome uh, very clearly is a clarity on the demand. What is it that you want done? Uh, this often is not always clear upfront. And I think the use of the knowledge, deliberation, uh, an extended network, really getting people to help you understand some of these things may lead you to a situation where there is clarity of demand and that demand really helps you even in any future conversations whether you're talking to uh, anybody uh, from the outside wanting to know what your problem is and what your ask is or actually going up to the media or going up to the government authority and really presenting the set of facts or why or why you don't want something why do i uh, object to the the acquisition xyz uh, or for that for that matter, why that acquisition should not take place uh, has to be very clear, clearly articulated. Are you looking for? Are we looking for a better relocation plan? Uh, are we looking for recognition of rights? What is it that we want the government to do in this situation? Uh, it's always useful uh, to put out. It could be three options, four options, all of it, but it's important to lay it out uh, pretty thick in a, a, you know in your communication. Number two, I think really, uh, really preparing oneself with uh, very clear, specific and brief arguments is, is, very, uh, is very useful. Sometimes you might get a lot of time in, in a government office. In many times, uh, many times you will not. So actually having a, a very clear, short, crisp version of what, what you want, which might sound very clinical but it might not really bring all your stories and your experience in that communication but in a government office is is useful to actually upfront present the facts saying that this is the problem this is what i want this is the law that is being violated very clearly you know mentioning that is, will be useful uh, and if you have more time then you more more uh, things can be elaborated upon in terms of the impacts experience if you have a listening ear as part of the government office I think these are very clear, uh, you know, things that you need to keep in mind. Dialogues and discussions are a very important part of struggles. Very often, when the struggle enters the dialogue stage, I have seen that comrades enter into dialogue without specifics. I feel when we start a dialogue, the demands should be very clear, specific. We need to be careful if the authority we are approaching is the relevant one for our concerns. Later, we get to know that the concern is related to water, but we are talking to the forest department. Identification of the issue or concern is very important. What are we demanding and who are the relevant authorities who can provide solutions to our concerns? This identification of which authority should be consulted for which problem is very crucial. Finally, a demand letter is also equally important. Usually, we place all our demands in a single letter leaving the authority thinking about which demand to act on. The problem should be specifically demarcated and solutions should be suggested as demands. The best way to associate the problems is with evidence. For example, if we say that the polluted water or effluent is being released in the river, then it should have the information on who released it and whether they are compliant with the concerned laws. Such a demand letter not only compels the authority to act, but also opens up channels for him to act. We have to be careful and prepared. Documentation is very important. We have to separate specific problems, show evidence, and suggest specific solutions. The authorities function as a system with lots of pressures and processes, but we have to make those same systems work in our favor. So we too have to prepare ourselves beforehand. Uh do try and obviously, uh, which most people do, but really take a written submission when you're meeting a, you know, meeting a government official. Uh, if you can actually get a written receipt that 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 uh, submission has been sub, uh, has been received by a government office or the clerk of the government office, and what is often useful is that a summary of that discussion is taken on board. Uh, 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 and understood and copied and notes are taken and you actually sub do a follow-up 
based on that discussion so the the meeting does not end right there uh, it's not based on your submission and you receive that there are th things that might have been discussed verbally or assured verbally it's always useful to actually gather that and go ahead and uh, do a follow up letter which which also goes on to on record being informed being networked and clarity in communication these are some of the key skills and attitudes that community leaders and activists can develop in order to effectively protect and advance the interests of forest dwelling communities like any other skill you will only get better at them with time and practice thank you for watching